And now for Tech24. Now we need to talk about neural tech machines which are already used by thousands of people to control their brains. UNESCO, the UN scientific and cultural organization, is warning that this rapidly advancing technology threatens human rights and needs to be regulated urgently. We can now bring in France24's tech editor, Peter O'Brien. Peter, great to see you. Talk us through what exactly neural tech is and how it's being used. Yeah, hi, Delano. What we have to bear in mind is that our brains are increasingly becoming something that we can read and write to, uh, a bit like a computer, using neurotechnology. So that's electrical or magnetic implants or scans. This can be either surgically invasive or not, with something like a helmet or patch. And this is not science fiction. It's here already. It's already a multi-billion dollar industry, and it's already been used by hundreds of thousands of people all around the world, mostly as part of clinical trials, extensive trials at that. And it's being used to treat all sorts of um, ailments and conditions, things like epilepsy, depression, Parkinson's, and it's even allowed quadriplegics to walk again. Hence why some people are really looking forward to this um, as a miraculous technology. Uh, in fact, the possibilities are limitless when you start to think about them. Um, if you can send a signal to your brain, you could potentially tell it when to wake you up, when to put you to sleep, what emotional states you want it to be in. You can imagine all sorts of uses from the everyday life to uh, military applications. I mean, the list just goes on and on. And scientists can already read what's happening in the brain, our thoughts, to a surprising extent. In May, for instance, a new paper was released um, which detailed how patients were watching silent films and and thinking about um, a description of what was going on. And the uh, decoder used was able to a fairly accurately write sentences that the um, patients were actually thinking of as they watched these films. Yeah, but that's a risk, right, uh, Peter? Because if somebody has all this information of my thoughts or whatever, what can they do with it? Well, that is that is absolutely one of the biggest problems here, and this is the reason why UNESCO is uh, so keen to ramp up regulation, re regulatory, re regulatory efforts on this. Um, I mean, they're racing against the clock is one thing, because investment in this tech has just in, in, doubled and doubled. I mean, it's increased 22-fold uh, from between 2010 and 2020. That's according to UNESCO's own research. And the number of patients' uh, patents filed between, uh, between 2015 and 2020 doubled in terms of who's calling the shots, a UNESCO report found that there's an even greater geographical divide in terms of the speed of neurotechnology development than there was than there is for AI, for instance, with the US leading the world far and beyond with its uh, its research on this. And as you say, in terms of the ethical concerns, well, as I'm sure our viewers can think of many of their own, but one of the most pressing is, of course, data privacy. I mean, it's a complete wild west out there in terms of uh, what companies are able to, to extract from their their sub, sort of test subjects' brains. Um, and this is potentially the most sensitive data you can possibly imagine because it's to do with our very thoughts. So although, as I've said, we're not able to read exact thoughts yet, we're getting pretty close. And uh, people like Raphael Eusta are worried about this. He's a leading neuroscientist and neuroethicist. He was at, a, at this UNESCO conference on Thursday and previewed a bit of research that he's done into 18 of the top neurotechnology companies in the world and what they're doing with people's data. Out of, out of 18 new technology companies take possession of all the brain data, okay? without exception. Moreover, 17 out of 18 endow upon them themselves to share that brain data with third parties. Okay? So that means if you share the data that you obtained from someone's brain with a third party, the third party in principle could do whatever he wants with it. So. The conclusion is that this is complete lack of protection. In fact, you cannot imagine less protection. <laughs> so Peter, what can be done then? Well, I think one thing I need to stress is that we're already seeing marketable neurotechnology products. That's something that people perhaps don't understand. If you look at, for instance, the NeuroPACE RNS system, that's already been approved by the FDA in the US. It detects epileptic seizures uh, based on our brain patterns and can send an electric signal to your brain to, to sort of um, calm those symptoms and stop those seizures from happening. So we need to know, first of all, that this is well and truly underway and, and we're already seeing some, some treatments start to go on the market. 
market. So in terms of what can be done, well, if you add that to the fact that uh, people like Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg are pouring lots and lots of money into this, and there's so little public understanding of what uh, uh, what ethical implications are, are, are that it's clear that there's a lot uh, of work that needs to be done. We are seeing some movement on this. Of course, we've got this UNESCO push that we're talking about. We've got the country Chile, which has pioneered regulation on this, becoming the first country to change its constitution to require the law to protect brain activity. France, the US, Argentina, Spain have all also taken some initial steps. But I'd say what's lacking really is a true understanding of what patients who are subject to this technology are going through. Um, Frederick Gilbert is a researcher at the University of Tasmania, and he's done a lot of work on this. Um, he points out that we don't really have any idea of how this uh, neurotechnology is really affecting patients' lives in terms of their well-being. So even though you might get the odd patient and the odd news story about someone who said their life has completely changed and it's solved their problems, you're likely to get another who's been badly addicted to the technology mm. or who became a shell of them for, for their former selves. There's some very sad, sad stories out there as well. I mean, he, he also worries that um, the fact that these patients have no control over their data once it goes to these companies. That's the thing. I think there needs to be a certain level of acceptance that your privacy is out the door. The thing is, it's in these uh, agreements that these test subjects are signing with the companies. It's there in the fine print. But there is no, there's no, not one of these companies is making an effort to, uh, exactly. not, when it, not any of the 18 top ones are making an effort to actually lock down the privacy of these patients. And when you think about the fact that AI will only increase our ability to, to understand these, this data from brains, um, well, in a few years, all that data could be decoded and, and exploited. Um, take a listen to Frederick Gilbert. More than 15 years ago in Australia, there was a clinical trial run by a company called NeuroVista, which needed to extract data from the brains of participants. The company went bust, and the data that had been collected became the property of people who bought the rights to this data. The people who participated in the trial lost the rights to their own brain data, which is worrying. Peter, thank you very much for that. Peter O'Brien there uh, with that uh, fascinating discussion on neurotech.